Hi everyone, welcome back to Project 2845. It's New Parts Day. We got in um, some of our six AH4 GT tubes that we want to use for our preamp, as well as some uh, a mix of RCA and General Electric 6BX7 GT tubes for our driver, our cathode follower driver, or at least that's the plan right now. Um, had a little bit of a tough time actually finding uh, some 6BX7s. They're not horribly expensive, but they are a little bit difficult to find. On the other hand, the 6AH4s, I was able to find a uh, one source that had a, a large stash of similar construction GE tubes. So that was pretty nice. And we should be able to find hopefully some good matches um, and good performing tubes in these batches. I took one of each, uh, so 6AH4 on the left and a 6BX7 on the right. This is the first time I'm seeing them in the flesh. And if you look at the construction of a 6BX7, the plates are really stuffed in there pretty good. It's a, it's very tight and I've not seen one of these, you know, small octal preamp tubes with that much going on inside of its structure. And it sort of makes sense looking at the data sheet. It really is a miniature power tube. So the plate structure is pretty big. On the other hand, the 6AH4, the plate structure actually looks like just a single 6BX7, just a single plate centered up in the envelope. And looking at the data sheet again on both of these, it kind of makes sense. They're very similar tubes, uh, this being a single triode and obviously the 6BX7 being a dual triode. So I think they repurposed the same construction and maybe just changed the grid spacing between these uh, because the amplification factors are just slightly different. But very similar tubes, which is exactly what we want for um, their, their, their performance is exactly what we want for high voltage and really wide signal swing and high transconductance, especially for this driver that we're gonna be using. So we should have, with this configuration, enough gain, enough signal swing with the, our gain tube and enough drive strength for our 845s with the 6BX7. We also got in our DigiKey parts. So I've got some new filament transformers here as we've discussed previously, the 6BX7 will have to be on a separate filament winding due to the heater elevation. So I needed another filament transformer because of that. But I also got a couple more of these in. I got, these are two triad, I think four amp, 6.3 volt units to play with uh, some different ideas for DC rectification for the filaments. As we saw with the Mu follower, um, when we were using the linear regulator on that proto board, we got much better performance on the front end uh, stage, uh, more than I would actually normally expect with uh, DC filaments. So I'm not sure if I'm going to use the linear regulator for that yet. The other problem with the linear regulator is the power dissipation for the filaments on these other tubes. If we tie this other gain, this the 6AH4 filament with the 6SN7 mu follower, if we common those uh, filaments, the current draw is pretty high and the power dissipation in that single linear regulator might be a little high. So what I wanted to play with was just using the, some different filament transformers in a couple different configurations and use a bridge rectifier with maybe an R, a dropping R resistor as needed and a, a RC with a large capacitance to do some simple filtering and try some DC filaments that way. So in the box, we also got in uh, our bridge rectifiers that we'll use for the filaments and, and a bunch of different uh, dropping resistors. One, to improve the filtering, but two, depending on the current draw of the total filament string off of a common um, transformer, we may need to just drop the voltage slightly to hit our 6.3 volt target across all the tubes. We also got in our 1000 volt depletion mode MOSFETs. And so that's going to form our constant current source for both of these stages, um, as well as some trim pots. So the trim pot will allow us to tune our current source based on the different um, performance of these MOSFETs. These MOSFETs aren't going to be well matched. So for every time we build this current source, we need a way to trim the current for, um, for both the preamp gain stage and the driver stage. And then these are uh, some proto boards that I'm gonna uh, mount the constant current sources to with a heat sink. So I've got 10 of these so I can build up 
uh, quite a few of these and test the performance variation of the depletion mode MOSFETs and make sure with our potentiometers we get enough sweep across the pot to hit our current targets for each of these stages across the variation of the depletion mode MOSFETs. So here's something I wasn't necessarily planning to cover but wanted to highlight it here since uh, it's showing up in a pretty uh, strong way. I've been testing some of these RCA 6BX7 GT tubes we got in on our uh, curve tracer box here. Here we got our curve tracer. It's mounted in this nice uh, Pelican case with this top plate. And for each of the internal connections, we got heaters, grid, cathode, screen, and plate. In this case, the screen and the plate are duplicating each other to test both plates in this dual triode. We can take these and jumper them to these tube sockets in all different configurations. So we can test any tube and reconfigure for any tube pinout, which is really handy. But we've got that 6BX7 in here. You can see it's warmed up with the uh, cathodes and heaters glowing uh, quite well. Nice looking tube. But there's clearly an issue with it, and I'll talk about that in a second. If we take a look at the transconductance curves of this tube, this is typically how I like to visually inspect a tube based on its curves. And these are uh, not the same type of curve you may be used to seeing where we've got our plate characteristics that are used for drawing load lines and doing standard amplifier stage analysis. These curves really each for, for fixed plate voltage show the delta on the grid in negative volts versus the plate current through the tube. And so uh, delta I per delta V is the transconductance of the tube. So the slope of each of these curves at these different plate voltages is exactly the transconductance of this tube. And the reason I like these is it shows how well the grid voltage has control over the plate current in the tube. So if there's an issue, we can usually spot them on these curves, and that's exactly what I'm seeing here with this, uh, with this tube. For this BX7 that we've got installed in the curve tracer, there's clearly a problem where there's basically a, what looks like a quiescent leakage. Regardless of the plate voltage, no matter how negative my grid goes, I can't uh, drive the tube to cut off or to zero current. As, you know, it, it stays, there's some leakage that maintains. And for each of the plate voltages I test, which was so far 100, 200, and 300, the quiescent leakage seems to step up proportionally. So there's clearly an issue, and most likely this will get worse with age, heat, and use, and may even cause a problem or a failure in the amplifier over time. And so this shows the importance of curve tracing like this. And we talk about this on our, on our Bandwidth Audio website and how for our products, we curve trace all of the preamp tubes in order to find good matches, but also to find problems like this. If we just stuck this in a tube tester and tested at an operating point somewhere over here, this tube would look fine. We'd never see this issue or this soft short with, uh, between the control grid and the cathode. So just wanted to document that, um, and maybe before I close out, what I'd like to do is just show what a good tube looks like. So this is the previous tube I tested. And you can see very clearly, one, the triodes are much better matched. You can see that the dotted and solid lines are right on top of each other. So this is a really nicely matched section to section tube, but also there's no grid control issues. We can, for each plate voltage, we can easily drive the tube to cut off. Before we close this out, I figured I'd give this uh, tube a try on our BK707 tube tester. This isn't a great tube tester by any means, but it's quick and dirty and kind of gives you, you know, just a yes, no, is the tube really functional? Other than that, I haven't found this thing to be incredibly useful, but it's a good first check what I wanted to do is see if this uh, tube tester is sensitive enough to pick up the issue we were seeing. So again, we've got that same tube running and it's good to go. It's all warmed up. And if I push the shorts, we can see that the, sh the shorts light comes on. 
if I push grid emissions, we get the light as well. So it's not always the case with these tube testers uh, I found. And in fact, I've had uh, this shorts and grid emissions come on intermittently for perfectly known good tubes. Um, but in this case, it is correctly and consistently indicating that there's a problem with this tube. If we try to run the tube, and try to get rid of the glare, section one looks pretty good, as does section two. So again, just goes to show you how, you know, you need to be careful, and, and sometimes these old tube testers won't catch these types of problems, especially if the shorts or grid emissions um, sensitivity isn't calibrated. There's actually an adjustment through, in the user manual it describes through one of these, somewhere, one of these tube sockets, there's a trim pot that you can stick a screwdriver down to, and there's a calibration procedure to calibrate uh, the shorts bulb when you run a short or grid emissions test. If that's not properly calibrated, then you have no chance picking it up. But even then, I've run into circumstances on uh, known bad tubes that this hasn't picked up. In known good tubes, this is intermittently at least thought were bad. So kind of an interesting test. And these old tube testers, you know, take, take with what they say a grain of salt. And thanks, and I hope you enjoyed this.